In 2003, Andy Lowings was inspired to recreate the ancient cold lyre of Ur, an instrument that had been destroyed when ISIS looted the Baghdad Museum earlier that year. It was, without doubt, ex the most exciting um, project I've ever done in my life. I think Jennifer would agree. I think we'd all agree. It's been a life changer. It's, it's been such fun to do. Andy, along with his friend Jennifer Sturdy, reached out to a variety of academics at museums and universities to research the ancient instrument. They then worked with volunteer students, artisans, and musicians to construct a playable replica of the lyre. What are we going to do with it, and how are we going to bring it to life? We can't find a, a handy Sumerian and say, well, what would you play with this? Welcome to the OI Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Townsend, and uh, I thought it had to be a host. It had to be a host. It must have been scary for people. Welcome to the OI Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Townsend. Today, we welcome some very special guests to our show. We have Andy Lowings, Mark Harmer, Steph Connor, and Jennifer Sturdy of the Liar Ensemble. Now, this group created one of the most unique projects I've ever heard of. In 2003, they created the Gold Liar of Ur project to construct a playable replica of a 4,550-year-old Gold Liar of Ur. And then... In the following years, they recorded two albums of poetry and music using this most ancient of instruments. So again, it's my great pleasure to welcome Andy Lowings, Mark Harmer, Steph Connor, and Jennifer Sturdy of the Liar Ensemble. When we talked about the idea of making the instrument at the outset, that the whole declared aim of it was to make a playable instrument, because I think we had been to some musical instrument museums. There's a very famous one here in London, the Horniman Museum, with instruments which are inside glass cases. Nowadays, of course, they very often have uh, recordings that you can listen to, but at the time, um, they were just stone cold and unplayed in 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 a glass case and that is so so tragic that you don't actually hear what the music sounds like and so having completed it then of course the next step is we must really try to perform with it there is somebody out there who is going to see this instrument for what its potential is in terms of music and it's probably not going to be me, but I'm pretty sure that there are people out in the world. And he ran a harp festival at um, Stanford, uh, near where he lives. And I came over there one day and uh, saw these lovely harps. And, and that was the first time I heard about the lyre. So I've, I've sort of known Andy for quite a while now and been involved in quite a few of his projects. Um, my own background is um, in broadcast. So I worked for the BBC for 20 or so years and done a lot of radio and TV. So, so it, was, it was lovely to be able to sink my technical teeth, if that's a good metaphor, into something that, um, that was a little bit different. When I came to this project, I had just finished a PhD at the University of York in music composition. So that's my, my background. I'm a composer, I'm now a lecturer in composition at the University of York. And my specialism if you like as a composer is generating new musical materials from uh, sound structures of ancient languages so um, that and that can include anything sort of from uh, the structure of poems from the kind of the longer structure of a, of a poem to the phonology of the words themselves and um, so I have various different ways of kind of using those sorts of things to to I mean, essentially, just generate new ideas for composition. That's really what I'm doing. I'm plundering ancient evidence to find new mm -hmm. ideas for modern creative work. Steph, you, you, you sang in Babylonian, and I know that on um, The Flood, which is uh, one of my favorite albums, uh, you, you sing in a number of languages. And, uh, you know, what, what languages do you sing in? Uh, what, you know, how did you learn this? And what, uh, what, why did you choose the text that you chose? Um, the CD includes a mixture of, um, of, of well, some sort of Sumerian and um, then some Akkadian, which uh, is probably a lot 
closer to what scholars would reconstruct as an original, you know, as a best guess version of the original pronunciation than uh, than than our sort of approximation of Sumerian is, because very little is known about how that's pronounced. So we were kind of just making that up. Um, and there's also some English, we sing some in modern English uh, translations of Mesopotamian texts. And then there's uh, possibly quite ill-advisedly because I don't think I really covered myself in glory uh, on the pronunciation of this one, uh, Arabic, <laughs> which was done with the very generous help of, of Andy's friend, Dr. Jalili. And, um, and that was a, a translation of a Sumerian text, a, a poem about uh, basically a kind of um, mother reverence poem, which I, I thought was very beautiful and moving. And, um, and we, I, I, tried, I tried my very best to sing that in Arabic. <laughs> uh, so we, we wanted to, to have a kind of mixture of, of, of different languages on the CD. The texts were, I, I chose the texts, most of them, um, some of them were kind of put in front of me by uh, Andy and um, Jennifer in the sort of the early stages of the project when we all met each other. Um, I just found after a while of doing some research and thinking, well, what, what texts might we sing, that I was particularly drawn to texts in which there was a, a sort of a strong female character or female voice um, for probably quite obvious reasons. Um, but it all really started with the, the text from Tablet 11, the flood narrative from the Epic of Gilgamesh from the Babylonian version. And, uh, and that was kind of coincidence, really. We had a weekend and I said, look, let's, let's come together with instruments. Let's see what can, we can make of these instruments. Something may happen. We can bang, we can sing, we can create something. And we tried pretty hard. Um, but this girl came along from was it, um, York University and said, do you think, um, you know, uh, perhaps I can sing something? And before we packed up for the day, she said, do you think I could just sing this? Andy had a selection of um, texts that we could work with that were, by and large, taken from a publication that had been made by um, Andy and Jennifer's friend Lorna Govier. She's a harpist um, and she'd made this with Anne Kilmer and it was a collection of contemporary settings of, um, of Sumerian and Babylonian texts and this was just kind of what what was available on the day. And I had absolutely no experience whatsoever of uh, singing in Babylonian at all. I, I'd just shown up to see what we could do and uh, and so um, we tried various different things and um, during one of the very, very lengthy tuning sessions, I imagine, I, I can't remember, but I guess that's what was going on at the time because it was what we spent most of our time doing. I was just browsing through this book um, and uh, I was looking at this um, normalization of the, the flood narrative in Babylonian, which was in the book and very conveniently had the stresses, the likely word stresses marked out for someone like me who didn't know anything about the language that was essential. So while all the instrument kind of stuff was going on and technical setup, I got my phone out and I Googled the Wikipedia article on Akkadian phonology. <laughs> 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 and I looked up how to pronounce um, mm. these words. And then I said, I want to try this. Let's try this. I want to sing this text. You could tell from the first five bars that this was magic. This was something, um, something fate was behind this and she sang in this foreign language. Um, I could hear immediately the pleading of humans, the gods dictating, um, women giving birth to new humanity, all in this voice of hers. And I was accompanying her. I felt that it was a, a great relationship. I loved what I did, but I was very, very frightened that I'd mess it up. And I remember one time I looked at, at, at Mark, who was recording this, and said, is it, is it happening? And he went, it's <laughs> don't mess up. And the version of that song that appears on the album, The Flood, which we made a few months later, was pretty much identical to that first demo recording, which by some weird coincidence we didn't really need to change despite having done zero preparation so a few months down the line having worked quite hard on studying Acadian I found myself doing almost exactly the same thing
This is an extract from a live performance of the title track from the album The Flood, and it's a setting of the, the flood narrative, which is um, part of Tablet 11 from the Babylonian version of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And um, it, in, in, this, in the sort of this, this narrative of the flood, which kind of differs from the biblical version in that um, rather than needing to get rid of humankind because they're sinful, the gods decide to get rid of them because they're making too much noise and it's, it's irritating them. <laughs> um, they, uh, they, they look back on the devastation that has been caused and even the gods themselves are, are horrified by what they've unleashed on, on the earth. And, um, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what's being described described at this point in the in the song. Flood CD that we created actually was born out of improvisation, I think I'm right in saying, and then as it, uh, it gradually emerged. And in fact, when we, we came to do the first broadcast, which actually was the first public performance as well, so, you know, why, why, why do something, you know, little when you can do something great, you know, live on radio, um, that was the first time we'd actually performed it anywhere. And it was, we actually went back to the CD which I had assembled over the course of about five or six months and really relearned the music from the CD. We sort of learned from our improvisations that we recorded and then sort of reproduced them. We had sort of the luxury of um, no one being paid <laughs> yeah. or having to pay for anything. So there was very much not a time is money mindset. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it was a project that was initially in the early stages just done uh, for joy, 
and and so we we had the the benefit of a, a beautiful church um access to a beautiful church near andy's house and the kindness of uh andy and uh, andy's wife mave in uh putting us up and feeding us while we were there and uh and jennifer also and so we were able to just hang out in this church probably spending 70 percent of the time tuning <laughs> yeah, i think there's a really interesting aspect about it as a musician which is playing thinking about our union chapel performance where we played the the flood piece which is just a, a set of notes repeated um and when you're playing it you're on the stage playing that and you you sort of obviously you've done your best and there's Steph singing away and there's an audience in front of you and everybody's expectant and you're thinking please please don't let this thing go you, you know this is going to go south on you if you're not careful you just have to be so gentle with it and you're trying to play this thing and you're, you're just hoping that it'll be, you know, it'll be good to you, that the gods, the tuning gods will be kind to you. And um, it's, it's quite an interesting experience. You know, it's hairy enough being a performer performing live, but performing on something that's so quirky is, is a whole new ball game, really. Um, what, we, what we actually have is eight similar length strings on a massive, great um, yoke. It's, there's everything wrong with it. Um, nobody would build that, but they did, and so we have to ask ourselves why, and if they played with it, what might they play, what would they tune it, how would they tune these eight similar length strings, which by and large give eight similar notes, um, unless you make them so tight that they're about to break, or so loose they don't make any sound at all, um, you, you've got to sort of say, well, what's, what does it say? It's amazing what you can do with those eight strings and that's been the revelation for me as a harpist to just discover what you can do with with just a limited resources but but really exploring them i found my notes from the radio 3 broadcast we did and i have all the tunings written out so um that's pretty much it in terms of the score i had is just tunings and notes about the repetitions and patterns uh, because on an instrument like this, you can't play melodies; you more play repetitious patterns. And I was and I was obsessing over um, exactly how the fourths and fifths were going to be tuned, whether it was going to be what um, you know ancient tuning systems, uh, rather than kind of using modern tuners, which tune it to the tuning systems we use for contemporary instruments. And uh, and Andy said, well, you know, that's all well and good, but uh, you know, listen to this and <laughs> and and played a string and in in the just in you know in the movement of the string and in, in the, during the decay of the sound um, in that envelope, the um, the pitch kind of shift is significantly more than the difference between the different kind of fifths that you might want to use, you know. So I say, oh, you know, it has to be a just intonation fifth. It can't be an equal temperament fifth, we, you know. And uh, and the difference was completely imperceptible because the, the pitch changes so much during the decay of the sound. All of this research and the, this corpus of, of, um, of, of cuneiform tablets points us in the direction of, of a pretty traditional um, uh, tonal progression. So we, we use it because it relates, the audience can relate to it. We're looking at, of course, uh, pitches, but there's the other side, which is rhythm, which is very important with, um, with lyres. And uh, I think that's, that's fertile ground, is how we interpret the rhythms that they play in Somalia and Egypt and Yemen with these, in, with these very simple instruments. Um, and they get some wonderful effects. I think you can be brutal with, with lyres. You can make them sound uh, dissonant. You can you can play them percussively. You can you can get a tune out of them, but with the harp, I think uh, certainly with the conventional Western harp, you get um, uh, it's it's about melody. So I suppose it concentrates your mind in a different way, and uh, that's that's what's been so fun about performing with Steph and, and Andy that that actually. It's 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 almost the amalgamation of three people working together can produce some quite extraordinary stuff. None of which is really conventional. <laughs> Shapir, <laughs> <laughs> 
battuti i calmo battuti e li battuti i mai due mi tutti i the only time I did some sound manipulation on that, which is that um, Andy playing the lyre, when you have a chord at the end or a huge sound of a, a gate slamming right at the, 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 the loudest part, um, that's actually the lyre strings shifted down one and two octaves. It produced this most extraordinary sound, which I just am very proud of and I, I love it. It's not just a musical instrument. I think it's a dramatic, it gives you dramatic possibilities and it looks phenomenal. You know, whenever you, whenever people see it, they go, wow. I think that when we play together, we, we, we use these um, rhythmic riffs over and over again, and they hypnotize the audience. They take, they take us to a different level. And I always remember playing with the Iraqi cultural forum when the, the hypnosis became so great that you, they spontaneously applauded and we had to stop. Where have you shared this music? Where have you uh, toured or who's heard it? Where have you performed uh, with, with all of this? We, we've put out a lot of stuff on, on YouTube. We've been to the States, a few countries in Europe. We'd like to go to more. Kind of academic um, venues. We have performed at uh, universities, at York University um, uh, was one of them, but also in cathedrals. So for example, in Liverpool Cathedral, uh, at various museums, the British Museum, um, in Washington DC, it was at the invitation of the Iraqi embassy. And we played in um, musical instrument museums and, um, and in schools. We were it's invited to, to, um, to show at Iraq in, in Baghdad um, a couple of years ago. And that was a great, a great honor to, uh, to, to bring it back. We must not forget that this particular artifact is, is um, very important, significant in uh, the life of Iraq today. And that they helped us a lot with this. Um, and it was a great moment to take it back to, to Baghdad, to play on, on the stage there, um, albeit in a very limited way um, in front of the television and um, it was a great moment there. I, I think it's very important that you tell people what we are not. It's not the real thing. We, know, we don't know um, how, they, how their tuning was. We, might, we have some guesses. Uh, we try our best. We've used the best sources we could, uh, very strong uh, research. And, um, but there's lots of things we don't know about it. But I often say that you remember that picture of the death of the death scene of all of the ladies of the court who seem to have committed suicide and that lady who still had her arm over the harp. We say that if she was here today with us on that performance, she would say, that's my liar. That's the one I played. So I, I just um, I think with regard to presenting contemporary performances using ancient instruments and, um, and evidence from the ancient world in general, uh, that it's, you know, important, first of all, to make it clear that, that what you're doing is an, an exercise in contemporary creativity and isn't, in, isn't a reconstruction of something tangible from the ancient world. It's not the sounds or the music of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, it's, it's a sort of complicated hybrid creature because it's not entirely unrestrained contemporary creativity. The musical materials themselves on the album The Flood and on um, a lot of the work that I do come from ancient sources, but the whole purpose of working with ancient materials in order to create new music isn't to answer questions about how music might have sounded in the ancient world. It's much more to ask questions about how music might have sounded. Um, and so in experimenting by pulling together 
ancient instruments, ancient texts, things that we know about ancient music theory and doing something new with them. We just go on a kind of process of discovery and, uh, and by, you know, using creative practice to, 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 to engage and have a kind of bodily relationship with those materials. Um, we ask questions that could potentially be useful in the future, but no one can answer them. <laughs> If you are interested in hearing more of The Flood, the Lyre Ensemble's music can be found on Spotify, YouTube, at various retailers, directly from lyreensemble.com, and on the Gold Lyre of Ur project website. I want to thank all of you for giving us your time and your experience and knowledge and the amazing music uh, and project that you've created and shared with the world uh, today. Andy, Jennifer, Mark, Steph, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. For over 100 years, the OI has been a leading research center for the study of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations. Join us in uncovering the past and learn about the beginnings of our lives as humans together. Become a member by visiting oi.uchicago.edu slash member.